this iconic film. We think of this as the end of America's war in Vietnam, right? In fact, that incident, those iconic images, uh, this all happened two years almost to the day after the American part of the war in Vietnam technically ended. The United States pulled its American troops and ended U.S. military operations in Vietnam in the spring of 1973. And then this all happened two years later. This was April 1975. When this happened, U.S. troops had already been gone out of Vietnam for two years. But that war in Vietnam, of course, it was not our war. That war was happening there before we got there, and that war was still happening there when we left. About a year and a half after the U.S. military ended its commitment in Vietnam in 1973, the communist forces in North Vietnam decided that they were going to launch a big new offensive that they thought would allow them to conquer the South once and for all and take over the whole country within two years. In the end, it didn't take them two years. It only took them about four months. The North Vietnamese, the communists, they won. And this picture, this iconic photo showing the evacuation of the last American personnel left in the country, as well as whatever Vietnamese employees and allies could squeeze under the proverbial off-ramp with the last Americans at that point, this iconic American image shows two years after the American military left Vietnam, the desperate efforts to get the very last remnants of American personnel out of South Vietnam and its capital as they were captured by the North. This was April 30th, 1975. Toward the end of America's war in Vietnam, the United States was going through some of our own upheaval at home. Uh, president Nixon, of course, resigned in disgrace in 1974. That made Gerald Ford into the president of the United States, even though no group larger than his congressional district back home in Michigan had ever elected him to anything. In April 1975, two years after the U.S. had pulled out our troops from Vietnam, when it was becoming clear that South Vietnam was about to lose the war, they were about to be conquered by the communists in the North. President Ford, in April 1975, he went to Congress and he asked Congress for a big new round of aid to try to prop up South Vietnam in the face of all this obvious evidence that they were about to lose the war and Vietnam was about to become a single communist country. And, and yes, it was clear that South Vietnam was about to lose the war. And yet we did still have a few thousand U.S. personnel of various kinds based at the embassy there. But when Congress, in 1975, when they looked at the size of President Ford's aid request, I mean, he was asking for three quarters of a billion dollars for South Vietnam. Congress looked at that request and balked. They said, no, no way. The Senate Foreign Relations Committee, at the time, they actually physically got up and walked over to the White House and sat down in the cabinet room at the White House and demanded to speak with President Ford about this aid request and why they were saying no. They said they basically were not going to restart the war in Vietnam no matter what was going on there. Senator Jacob Javits of New York told President Ford that day in this remarkable meeting in the cabinet room at the White House, which the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, Armed Services Committee, invited themselves to. Jacob Javits told President Ford, I will give you large sums for evacuation, but not one nickel for military aid for South Vietnam. Senator John Glenn was in the room too, famous astronaut and pilot, right? He told President Ford to his face, this is an amazing quote. The idea here is very different from what I envisioned, he said. I and most senators thought of a surgical extraction, not of a 10-day or two-week operation with a bridgehead. Senator Glenn said, this is a re-entry of a magnitude we have not envisioned. I can see North Vietnam deciding not to let us get these people out and attacking our bridgehead. Then we'd have to send forces to protect our security forces. That, he said, fills me with fear. John Glenn, famous astronaut, famous test pilot, says, that fills me with fear. Congress was willing to fund an evacuation. Congress was willing to fund getting every last American out entirely, every last one out of Vietnam, even if it meant plucking them off the roof of the embassy by helicopter. But Congress was not willing to provide one nickel for further military help for the government and for the South Vietnamese military, which more than 50,000 Americans had already died trying to prop up. President Ford wanted back in to Vietnam to stop that from happening, and the Congress said no way. They said it in dramatic fashion to his face in the White House when they were not invited.
I should note that one of the senators who was in the room that day when that super dramatic fight was happening, when the Senate committee got up from their seats on Capitol Hill and marched to the White House and sat down in the cabinet room to see the president, one of the senators on the Foreign Relations Committee that day having that confrontation with the president was a very young senator named Joe Biden of Delaware. He took part in that meeting when he was a senator in his first term. The country was so against the Vietnam War, and Congress was so determined that no president would ever be able to get us into something like that ever again, that the Congress had passed something in 1973 uh, called the War Powers Resolution. President Nixon, he was still president then, he vetoed it, but they passed it over his veto anyway. It had that much support. And that War Powers Resolution was an effort by the Congress to assert that it was their job under the Constitution to make decisions about war and peace. It's Congress's job to make make those decisions, not the president's. And while the power of that resolution has been questioned and some say it has withered over the years, in 1975, when Gerald Ford wanted to restart the war in Vietnam effectively, that resolution was very fresh in Congress's minds. And Congress had no qualms whatsoever about telling him no when he said he wanted back in to Vietnam. And so that is how that iconic footage, those iconic images came to be. Because over President Ford's objections, we did just evacuate as Saigon fell. Those pictures were taken on April 30th, 1975, and that is the day, the day, that Saigon fell. The communists from the north renamed Saigon Ho Chi Minh City. Two weeks later, the communists held a victory parade through Saigon. And to this day, Vietnam is a communist country. And yes, that is how we left it. Since then, Vietnam went through a series of market-based economic reforms in the late 1980s. They, they opened up a stock market in the year 2000. That's the year that President Bill Clinton visited Vietnam in November 2000, November that year. For the past decade, Vietnam has had one of the highest economic growth rates in the world. In 2007, Vietnam joined the World Trade Organization. Right now, Vietnam's big fight in the world is a standoff they're having over fishing rights and maybe oil rights or mineral rights uh, with China in the South China Sea. Today, because he is required to under the War Powers Resolution of 1973, President Obama sent this declaration to Congress, making his formal, legally required accounting of where U.S. military forces are deployed around the world and for what. U.S. forces, according to the President's letter that he sent to Congress today, uh, are in Afghanistan and Somalia and Yemen and uh, Cuba at Guantanamo Bay, in Niger, in Chad, uh, in Uganda, in other unspecified places in Central Africa, Egypt, Jordan, Kosovo, Libya. Uh, there's no mention in the president's declaration today about U.S. forces being in Pakistan. That maybe depends on what you define as forces. For all the American political debate about the U.S. using drones to kill people in Pakistan, there's actually been no drone strikes, at least as far as anybody knows, uh, in Pakistan since Christmas. Before last night, it had been six months since there had been a U.S. drone strike in Pakistan, but apparently there was one last night and another early today. Reports are still fuzzy because they always are, because these things are secret, but it seems that there were 11 suspected militants in Pakistan killed in the first drone strike last night, and another eight people were killed in the second drone strike early this morning. These drone strikes, again, the first in six months in Pakistan, they come just three days after the Pakistani Taliban launched an attack on the biggest airport in Pakistan. They attacked the airport, the huge airport in the huge city of Karachi. The attack left 36 people dead, including 10 very well-armed attackers. The United States had reportedly stopped all its drone strikes in Pakistan last year at the request of the Pakistani government because they wanted to stop them as a sign of goodwill as they entered into peace talks with the Taliban. After this attack on the civilian airport three days ago, though, there were notably no complaints from the Pakistani military about the U.S. apparently starting its drone strikes up again last night. So the president's letter today makes no mention of Pakistan, even though we did apparently fire something like 14 missiles into Pakistan just over the last 24 hours. President Obama, in his letter, he does note uh, that a classified annex to this report to Congress provides some additional information. So maybe that's where they talk about Pakistan. But of course, we never get to see that stuff. Also not mentioned in the president's declaration of all the myriad places we've got U.S. forces deployed right now is the nation of Iraq. 
And maybe we do have some super secret classified force there that we're not allowed to know about, like we do in lots of other countries around the world. But the fact is that conventional declared U.S. forces are not there anymore at all, other than a small embassy protection contingent of about 200 troops. As the news from Iraq in the last few days has gone from terrible to legitimately frightening, there isn't a U.S. presence there. Nobody knows if the next fall of Saigon is going to be the fall of Baghdad. But the pictures today of these young men and teenagers in Baghdad, these are young men and teenagers in Baghdad voluntarily signing up to join the Iraqi army. They did open air army recruitment events in Baghdad today. They're signing up to fight to try to save their city as militant groups approach Baghdad. And the pictures today of U.S. made military equipment that was provided to the Iraqi army, the pictures of that equipment being set on fire in the streets of Mosul or not set on fire and instead driven over the border into Syria to be used there in the war against Bashar al-Assad, it is almost as viscerally wrenching, right, to see those images as it is to see those people reaching for the skids of the helicopter as it took off from the embassy roof in April 1975. When the United States invaded Iraq in 2003 under false pretenses, the Bush administration and its supporters at the time, they, they played up what turned out to be false threats about the existing Iraqi government, and they aggressively played down any possible negative consequences of the U.S. invading Iraq and toppling that government. There's been a certain amount of, frankly, uh, Terry, a kind of pop sociology in, in America that, you know, somehow the Shia can't get along with the Sunni and they, the, the, the Shia in Iraq just want to establish a, some kind of Islamic fundamentalist regime. There's almost no evidence of that at all. There are other differences that suggest that peacekeeping requirements in Iraq might be much lower than historical experience in the Balkans suggests. There's been none of the record in Iraq of ethnic militias fighting one another that produced so much bloodshed and permanent scars in Bosnia. We have no idea what kind of ethnic strife might appear in the future, although, as I've noted, it has not been the history of Iraq's recent past. That kind of thing's never happened in Iraq, other than, you know, Saddam gassing the Kurds and the huge Shia rebellion in the south and the whole Saddam government and the Ba'ath Party and the army all running as a despotic Sunni tyranny over the other sectarian groups in the country and the other sectarian groups in the country resisting with all they had. Other than that, there's no reason to think there's ever going to be any ethnic or sectarian issues in Iraq. I looked it up. That was how the Bush administration tried to silence anybody who had doubts about the wisdom of invading Iraq in 2003 or, 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 or what an undertaking it would be or how big a problem it was going to be for that long. Specifically there in that clip that we just showed, that was Paul Wolfowitz trying to shut up then Army Chief of Staff Eric Shinseki, who had said publicly that we probably need a much larger force to try to hold Iraq together than the Bush administration wanted to say that we would have to send. Iraq did descend into chaos and then into sectarian and regional civil war as soon as Saddam Hussein was ousted and the army was disbanded. Over more than eight terrible years fighting there, the American fight in Iraq was not so much against the Iraqi army, which basically dissolved on contact with the initial invasion in 2003 before it was formally disbanded. The fight was instead between Iraqi factions and terrorist groups and insurgent militia groups fighting against each other and against U.S. forces. And when U.S. forces ended their combat operations in Iraq on the timetable established by the Bush administration in 2010, and thereafter, the Iraqi government would not consent to any agreement to keep U.S. forces after that point. Well, then, U.S. forces did leave, all of them. And naturally, the battle between sectarian groups and terrorist groups and militias and the insurgent groups that Saddam had fought and strong-armed with a despotic iron fist for all of those decades, yeah, naturally, those fights kept going. And now an army of several thousand radical Sunni fighters has taken over a wide and growing swath of Iraq, and also Syria. And now they say they are marching to Baghdad. And here at home, the people who most aggressively argued that we ought to start that Iraq war in 2003, those same exact people are now arguing that the United States ought to get back in there again. Senator John McCain, who based his 2008 presidential campaign around an aggressive campaign to further escalate the Iraq war, who'd been one of the most aggressive proponents for that war in the first place. Today, John McCain went to a classified briefing on the situation in Iraq. He went to that briefing for a couple of minutes. 
After a couple of minutes, he walked out of the briefing in order to go get back out in front of the cameras, where he demanded the resignation of President Obama's entire national security team, announced who President Obama should hire back from the good old Iraq war days to replace all of his current team, and then he called the security situation in Iraq now, quote, the greatest threat since the Cold War. John McCain has identified a lot of greatest threats since the Cold War. This is the current one for him. The New York Times today, apparently with no self-consciousness about it whatsoever, uh, went back to this guy uh, for quotes about not just how terrible it is in Iraq right now, but specifically how terrible it is that the Obama administration is not sending the U.S. military back into Iraq. Uh, the guy's name is Ken Pollack, Kenneth Pollack. He authored this book you might remember from 2002, The Threatening Storm, The Case for Invading Iraq. Ken Pollack was a leading mouthpiece for the bogus Iraq weapons of mass destruction claim. That was part of his argument. The other part of his claim for why we should invade Iraq was that invading Iraq was going to be super easy and super cheap. Listen to how this guy sold it. Look. In purely economic terms, it is unimaginable that the United States would have to contribute hundreds of billions of dollars, and highly unlikely that we would have to contribute even tens of billions of dollars. He said, those who argue that the United States would inevitably become the target of unhappy Iraqis generally also assume that the Iraqi population would be hostile to U.S. forces from the outset. However, the best evidence we have suggests that the Iraqi people would be pleased to be liberated. He was basically the captain of Team Wrong in 2002, Ken Pollack. But incredibly, today, the New York Times goes back to him as an Iraq expert, specifically to get his views on why it's so awful that the Obama administration is not putting the U.S. military back into Iraq again. These pictures uh, were taken the day before yesterday in Mosul. Uh, showing some of the aftermath of the Sunni militants taking over that city. You see on the ground there, on the median there, that's, that's clothing. Those are Iraqi army uniforms that were stripped off by members of the Iraqi military. They stripped their uniforms off, left them on the street, and fled. When the U.S. invaded Iraq 11 years ago, the U.S government at the time made a decision to disband the existing Iraqi army and instead tear that one apart and build a brand new one from scratch. And the U.S. government, U.S. taxpayers have funded that project of building a brand new Iraqi army, arming them and training them. We funded that to the tune of hundreds of billions of dollars. Remember, that was, that was the whole strategy for why we had to stay so long. Our military is helping to train Iraqi security forces so that they can defend their people and fight the enemy on their own. Our strategy can be summed up this way. As the Iraqis stand up, we will stand down. And as I remind the good folks of Idaho, our strategy can be summed up this way. As the Iraqis stand up, Americans will stand down. And what that means is, as more and more Iraqis take the fight, to the few who want to disrupt the dreams of the many, that the American troops will be able to pull back. Our policy is stand up, stand down. As the Iraqis stand up, we'll stand down. That was the political bumper sticker justification in the United States for why the Iraq war had to go on for so much longer than the American public could stand it. It was because we had to build and train up and stand up a brand new Iraqi army. Well, they are not standing up anymore. The battle for Mosul, for that city in Iraq this week, that battle is estimated to have been a battle between a few hundred, maybe a thousand of these Sunni extremist fighters on one side. The Iraqi military forces on the other side, roughly 30,000 in Mosul. But it was the 30,000, it was the Iraqi military that turned, dropped their uniforms, dropped their weapons, and took off. Les Gelb uh, at the Council on Foreign Relations uh, today calls this in Iraq history as usual. He says the U.S. fights in Iraq and Afghanistan and Libya and Vietnam, provides billions of dollars in arms trains the friendly soldiers, and then begins to pull out. And what happens? Our good allies, on whom we've squandered our sacred lives and our wealth, fall apart. That's what's happened in all of those places. That's what's happening in Iraq now. No amount of U.S. air and drone attacks will alter the situation. This kind of outcome was inevitable for Iraq, given the political lay of the land in that country. It is almost certainly what is also going to happen 
in Afghanistan. There, too, we fought and died, equipped and trained hundreds of thousands of Afghan troops. There, too, Americans should not be surprised if the Taliban soon regains the offensive and Afghan troops take off their uniforms, lay down their arms, and run. Remember Vietnam, he says? The South Vietnamese had a million and a half men under arms. These armed forces had plenty to fight with, but they gave up, too. The United States military is the biggest, finest, most expensive, most professional, most well-armed, most disciplined military in the world. There is no military battle that can be waged against the U.S. military that the U.S. cannot ultimately win. But that does not mean that everything that we want to win can be construed as a U.S. military battle. Right now, the people who thought it would be easy and a great idea and cheap to invade Iraq under George W. Bush, they want us to restart that war again. Frankly, if you press them, they'll tell you they wish it had never ended in the first place. But if you look at those arguments today and, and you're overwhelmed by a feeling of, oh, my God, we have been here before, that feeling is not just because we have been in Iraq before. It's because we have been here before as a country in a big way. And we know how this goes. We, of course, are saddened, indeed, by the events in Indochina. But these events, tragic as they are, portend neither the end of the world nor of America's leadership in the world. We can and we should help others to help themselves. But the fate of responsible men and women everywhere in the final decision rests in their own hands, not in ours. So it was, and so shall it ever be. Richard Engels in northern Iraq, and he joins us live next.